Hey there, doing something a bit different on this video. We are looking at photos from June 1959. My dad went there when he was 15 years old that summer and took some really cool black and white photos of Disneyland less than four years after it opened. And this first one is of Sleeping Beauty Castle which of course was an opening day attraction, 77 feet tall is still there, designed by Roland E. Hill. What I love is even at this point, they had a walkthrough attraction. In 1957, it opened. It was redone multiple times, including the most recent in 2008. And it's crazy too to think about that Sleeping Beauty, the film, was not released until 1959. That is so crazy because, of course, the castle was part of Disneyland at the start. And I know some people look at it and say, this is not as impressive as Cinderella Castle at Walt Disney World. And it's all about how it fits in the park. Because I feel like Sleeping Beauty Castle fits really well given the size and charm of Disneyland and would not fill well at the Magic Kingdom and Walt Disney World, and vice versa for Cinderella Castle. They both fit their parks so well. Disneyland, as Rolly Crump used to say, hugs you and just is different than how gargantuan and grand the Magic Kingdom feels. And getting to view this castle so early on is very cool in this picture. It's something super special that I enjoy seeing from such an early time. This photo is from the Skyway, of course, which went through the Matterhorn. Skyway opened in June of 1956, closed for a while actually, but at this point had reopened because quite a few of these pictures seem to be coming from the Disneyland Skyway. Now, I don't believe the Matterhorn, which opened on June 14th, had opened yet at this point. Just given the fact you can see down there, it seems like they're still doing construction. There's even a car down there in the pathway. So I get the impression this is shortly before the opening of the Matterhorn, which is pretty cool. I don't know the exact date that my dad and his parents went to Disneyland. But, you know, if you think about when school typically ends, though, I don't know what it was like in 1959, but it may have been just before the grand opening or they had the grand opening and then we're doing some maintenance or some work afterwards. This is going to come up again with our look at the submarine voyage a little further down. But for right now, we're looking at the Matterhorn in its earliest stage either right around when it opened. You see, there wasn't as much snow on it. You could still have the Skyway go through it. I remember riding the Skyway through the Matterhorn when I went there as a kid in 1985. I was nine years old at the time, and it was super cool. And the Matterhorn in this early stage also had quite a few changes happen to it as it went along, you know about the most recent update where they add in like the broken vehicles and kind of fit in with that mold and some of the updates to the effects. But this version was its earliest form and still at the time was one of the coolest things. I mean, it was Disney's essentially Disney's first thrill ride. And now we have a different view of the Matterhorn that is a nice, cool shot. Again, you see. Just a little snow at the top, and this was the first tubular steel roller coaster in existence. Like I just said, Disney's first thrill ride, and something also to note, too, about the Matterhorn. Wow, doesn't it look amazing there? It's, it's really something special, is that the original version did not include Harold, the abominable snowman. Some of the theming was not on par as the way it is now, where you kind of felt like you were going through all the different caves. So... I wonder what it was like to ride that. It was still probably at the time just mind-blowing. But Disney made quite a few changes in the 1970s into what a lot of us look at as the Matterhorn at that time. I don't know how the Hurt Back related to that. you know. But I still enjoy riding it, especially just that kind of classic Disney coaster inside a mountain 
you know, precursor to what Disney did at Space Mountain indoors, and then more recently with things like Expedition Everest. And this was based on the 1959 film, but I have never seen Third Man on the Mountain, you know, which of course involves climbing a very tall mountain. That's about all I know about it, but I know that it was the inspiration for the Matterhorn, which has far exceeded its original source material. And of course, part of its source material is the Matterhorn itself, (laughs) the mountain, you know, where this one is not nearly as large as that one, which you can see in Soarin' Around the World. But here, it's still something special, and the Force perspective makes it seem so much taller than it actually is. And it also becomes, you know, seems huge compared to Sleeping Beauty Castle, where, again, if Cinderella Castle was there, you would not have that same experience because it would dwarf the Matterhorn in a very different way. Here's another shot from the Skyway. This time, we are getting a view over the dark ride Alice in Wonderland. This is the original version, which opened in 1958 with Claude Coates designing it along with a team of other Imagineers. It came after the initial group of dark rides like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and Snow White and Peter Pan and had a very different vibe, including what you can see right here, which is the outdoor section. It was also the first Disneyland dark ride to have two floors, and that added some scale and space to it, even though it was kind of tucked away in the corner over here. And I love having this view where you can see the ride vehicles, which still are the same today, but then also get a view kind of from the bottom part there as people are boarding and going in, And then from the top part where you have kind of the outdoor section, which has been updated, uh, well, multiple times. They had the big update in the Fantasyland overhaul, which was true for all the dark rides. Alice in Wonderland's update didn't open until 1984, but then they did the updates due to OSHA and having the railings. So you don't obviously know railings. That was a lot more recent, though. That did not happen in 1984. Another thing about this picture that interests me is the background where you can see the pirate ship, the Chicken of the Sea pirate ship, which has not survived to today, but was quite an icon of Disneyland. You see a lot of pictures from the 50s and 60s with that pirate ship in it. And you're like, oh my gosh, what was that? It's like, well, they sold tuna at the bottom. But I think it was more than that. It was about the vibe of the entire park and that fantasy land area. Having that big ship there, which I know they did end up having to remove for other attractions. But a very cool part of the early days of Disneyland. And now we're looking at what I referenced earlier, the submarine voyage. And as you can see there, there are some workers working on the sub. So that leads me to also believe that this happened before the grand opening on June 14th, 1959. Now, again, this could be a case where they went on a day where it was being worked on and they did the big TV special and the opening and everything and then had to work on it more. But it inclines me to believe that this likely was probably one of the first few weeks of June. But if you look really carefully there next to the submarine, I believe you can see some mermaids swimming around. Now, I'm not 100% sure. It could be something else. So definitely correct me in the comments. If you think, Dan, you're being crazy, There there are not mermaids in this picture. But in the early times of the submarine voyage, there were mermaids. If you look at something like some of the early films from that time period in the 50s, 60s and such, You would see mermaids, and then you see, of course, they have these shots of the men in their ties going, oh, but overall, I think the submarine voyage, it's interesting. I'm glad that they were able to save it with the Finding Nemo version, which opened in 2007, and the first half of that ride actually feels pretty familiar in that it takes a more serious direct approach, looking through the porthole, you're seeing a lot of things and you know when you hear the audio in like the disney box set 50th anniversary other releases of the original submarine voyage it's like this guy's being especially serious there's not any type of jokes or much anything else it's pretty straightforward and you can see that in the design of the submarines at this time but i feel like the nemo version kind of veers off and um not a great way but overall i'm glad that you can still ride a variation of this attraction today at Disneyland, which is pretty cool. 
Oh, and here is the original TWA Moonliner, which stood as the icon of Tomorrowland in the 50s and part of the 1960s up until the big 1967 World on the Move Tomorrowland update. This stood around 80 feet. It was also taller than Sleeping Beauty Castle. Everything's taller than Sleeping Beauty Castle, I'm sorry to say. But right next to it was the original Rocket to the Moon attraction, which was a precursor to Mission to Mars. And you think about it, 1959 at that point was prior to Alan Shepard going up into space, well, anyone going up into space. And 10 years before, we had Apollo 11, where you know Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin ended up on the moon. So quite early, I mean, obviously, Tomorrowland, this was kind of the big draw or big thing of Tomorrowland. Yes, you did have other attractions, you know, the, the Hall of Aluminum or the Bathroom of the Future, the other things they've had in and out over the years. But this, obviously, it's not a surprise here that the picture that was taken of the main area in Tomorrowland was of this big moonliner which it's it's too bad that didn't survive. I know they have the little one still, but this particular one was quite impressive and also led you in towards the attraction, which the idea was very similar, the idea that you were taking a rocket to the moon. And of course, you never actually get there the way that you want to. There's, you know, something happens, but it was quite different. And I admit, I never experienced that version. I did ride Mission to Mars at Walt Disney World mostly as a kid and possibly at Disneyland if I if it lined up correctly with the time. Now completely gone today, unfortunately. We are shifting gears here to the rivers of America. And far away, if you look in the distance, you can see the wonderful Mark Twain Riverboat. Amazingly, an opening day attraction. You see some of those old videos, and it's just, there's so many people. You remember um, Louis Armstrong performing on it in a special, and, you know, the Mark Twain was a centerpiece of Disneyland. It still kind of is now, you know, even now with its use in Fantasmic, but it was one of those attractions, just that classic old-school riverboat idea and going around the rivers of America, Frontierland and the rivers of America, Seems much more central to Disneyland than it does to Walt Disney World. The other thing you can see in this picture is Tom Sawyer Island. And if you kind of squint, you can see all those people waiting on the dock for their raft to get back to civilization from Tom Sawyer Island. And I noticed too here, there just does not seem to be as much vegetation, which has grown up, obviously, since this time, given that this was only, like I said, not even four years from the opening in July 1955. We're in June 1959 here. But it's still very cool to see the Rivers of America and see the, it's in its dock there, but the Mark Twain kind of preparing either to let off or take passengers to make the ride around the river. I love riding these river boats. I don't know if it's just getting older and everything. Same thing with Walt Disney World. I just really enjoy the fact that they're there and you can kind of take a break, especially on a crowded day where you can sit there and take a break and view the various attractions, see a lot of kind of little set pieces here and there, but most importantly, just relax and appreciate the fact that you are in Disneyland and getting to enjoy it. And the river boats do such a good job of that. Speaking of doing a good job, here is the sailing ship Columbia. So Disneyland, I love the fact that there are two boats, and that doesn't even take into account the Davy Crockett River Canoes, but two large boats, including the Columbia, which opened in 1958 on June 14th. June 14th apparently is the day when Disneyland decides they want to open things. This was a full-scale replica of the first American ship to circumnavigate the globe, and I also love that in Fantasmic, they do use the Columbia as the pirate ship. So both the Mark Twain and the Columbia, yet one of many reasons, even though it's not currently operating due to the dragon issue, <laughs> but it will be coming back at some point next year, but that the Rivers of America is just so much better at Disneyland and so much more important. I'm glad now with everything kind of coming back and the railroads back with Galaxy's Edge open 
But looking at this picture in, in particular, again, you see the Columbia as it kind of is prepped to get moving there with people standing beside it. I appreciate this more than the Mark Twain. And it might be a case where because I've done the Liberty Square Riverboat so much at Walt Disney World that having the open air boat like it is where there's much more space to maneuver, we experienced this on our last trip to Disneyland last summer. And I made sure to do it because it's just so cool. It doesn't seem to get as many people, at least from my experience. You can go down below and see kind of the quarters of the crew and everything else down there. There's something similar in the Mark Twain. But to me, these are both quintessential Disneyland, having these riverboats along the rivers of America while you go by all the attractions. It's one of the coolest things about this area and makes Frontierland something truly special, along with Tom Sawyer Island, which I know now is the Pirate Slayer. This is our final picture, and it is, I believe, again from the Skyway. And this is of the Mad Tea Party, which, as you notice, at Disneyland is open air versus the way to the Florida. Understandably so, given the climate in Florida. And so it's very cool to have that shot with the multicolored Mad Tea Party right there. Another thing that I really enjoy of this is you get an image of the Mickey Mouse Club Theater, which was a very early theater that they had at Disneyland. It eventually, five years later, became the Fantasyland Theater that many of us know so well. Another part is this area now includes Pinocchio, which wasn't added until 1983. That was not an original Fantasyland dark ride. It was one added like as the new dark ride, which I've always find kind of humorous given that Pinocchio, the film, hadn't come out till like 40 years earlier. But it is a strange or creepy dark ride that I enjoy very much. But looking at this photo, it is not a surprise. Most of these photos, Disneyland looks very quiet and not crowded, with the exception of here with Fantasyland. It kind of shows you where, continuing today, but especially at that time, that Disneyland's focus in terms of crowds and attractions and films was Fantasyland. It was the hot place. This is the most crowds you see, I think, in any picture. There are some people that we had seen near Alice in Wonderland, but this one is on another scale. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at some cool photos from June 1959 from my dad's trip to Disneyland. If you'd like to learn more, there's lots of cool blogs and podcasts about Disney history. I have interviews with Imagineers and a lot more. Go to TomorrowSociety.com. You can find all about it and also check out photos like this, plus a lot of other cool things. If you enjoyed what you see, please subscribe to the channel. I would love to grow this channel and continue to make it something even cooler in the future. Thank you so much.